Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the channel. Matt here from Bramski Vlogs. We are back with another ski chat. Hope you guys are doing really, really well. Staying safe where you are, and I hope you do have a good Christmas. So, so far with these ski chats, we've heard from ski businesses, we've heard from lobby groups, but today I'm really excited because we're going to be hearing directly from the heart which, of all skiing, and that is the Season Air community. We're going to be speaking to two guys who are at the heart of running global season air network this focuses on recruitment training community and advice opportunities for potential and existing seasonal workers besides having their own website they have a facebook group with almost 13,000 members so without further ado i'm going to bring in alex and josh guys welcome Good Hi, Matt. Yeah. So first of all, guys, I, just as we were waiting to go live there, I saw that you do have a bit of a drink in your hands. So why don't you tell us what you're drinking? Alex, you go first. Uh, this is a, this is 1606 Gin, which uh, you can, I don't know, it's just a gin company that comes off Amazon and it's bloody, bloody delicious. So yeah. Good. Josh, what about you, mate? You said you had uh, a hairy yeah. night last Classic lager, yeah. Trying to get over last night's wine. Oh, yeah. yeah. Cheers. <laughs> good enough. I'm on the uh, Japanese gin, so cheers to you guys. Hope you have a good Christmas. Likewise. Right. Sante, Sante. Sante. So first of all, guys, uh, what I like to do at the start of these is, is get the, the guests to do a bit of an introduction um, to the viewers, to tell them a little bit about themselves, their background, and what they're involved in. So, uh, Alex, why don't you go first? Yeah, so I... Uh, I guess I did my first season in 2010 and I didn't actually become, I didn't get introduced to winter until I started working for Nielsen and I started working for Nielsen in 2013, did a, did three years on the bounce in Ledders Alp, learned how to, learned how to snowboard, uh, decided that I wanted to be, to try and get quite good at it. So I did, I did that then I, and I worked for, I worked for Nielsen, Smithies Tavern in Ledders Alp. Then I started doing winters where I just did like dodgy, my own kind of thing, uh, doing taxi journeys and stuff back from back from Scotty's in the plan in the middle of the night for for staff and things like that. It was, and then um, and then I run another business called Turtle Straws, which is straws made out of straw. And then it was Josh and me did my first winter together, and then Josh brought me into. GSN only in September this year to just see if we can get it moving along a bit. I think is the best way to describe. I'll, I'll let Josh go. Yeah, I'll let that, Josh yeah. go from there. But that's basically, yeah, that's it. I've done. I guess ten years of ten years of winters and winters and summers is my is my seasonal experience doing bar work, getting by, and uh, and I was a nanny in the summer as well, which people always are very surprised by. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I think I think you look like a I think you look like a, a very uh, trustworthy nanny. Yeah, never lost, never lost a kid. <laughs> yeah, um, Josh, what about you, mate? Uh, so I started seasons back in 2012. Um, did back to back summers for eight years, and this is the first year I've not um, not actually done a summer season. Mostly working for Nielsen, which is where I met Bruce. Um, and then working for a small company in Spain as well. I actually started, I often get mistaken as a, for a beachy and windsurf instructor. I've never actually worked on a beach. I've always been a mountain bike guide. <laughs> so, uh, but I always love the beach and all the water sports and, alongside it. And then done five ski seasons as well. Uh, working in chalets, working in bars and various different things. And yeah, so 2013 met Alex got on really well it turns out we actually live one road away from each other is just quite handy yeah yeah and um and then from there yeah as i started to develop global season air network i just needed someone to give me a hand and sort of help develop it further which is where alex comes comes in he's already started his own business and does really well with it so um it was great business partnership from there yeah. Awesome. Well, listen. Let Let's get into Global Season Air Network then, because I because I'm on your 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 Facebook page, and and funny enough, this all came about actually just uh, uh, you know you guys were kind enough to let me um, advertise one of my recent interviews uh, on your page. But um, first of all, let's talk talk about you guys. So Josh, just talk about how it all came about first. 
So I was actually trying to recruit staff for Nielsen uh, back in I think, 2017. Um, I was desperately looking for buy guides and was really struggling to find people that could do full seasons or had already done seasons or qualified. And um, I just wanted to find somewhere where all the season airs were in one place. And it turns out there wasn't anywhere. <laughs> so someone gave me the bright idea of starting up a Facebook group to put all the season airs into one place and use it to help me recruit my staff as well as help other people recruit theirs. And uh, overnight it took off. In the first week, we had over a thousand people in there. And it's just gone leaps and bounds up to yeah, where we are now, nearly 13,000 people. Um, I'm no longer using it to recruit for my staff, but we happily yeah, open it up to everybody to post jobs on there, to find out where there's jobs going, to seeking advice for people's first seasons or anything like that, or even travel sharing for people looking to drive out to seasons who want people um, to drive with. It's, all sorts. I, I think that one of the best things is the about it is that if you've got a question, if you're brand new or you want to do the best one is like when you see someone who's looking for insurance or who's looking, how can, is it easy to take my car to, 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 to the, to the mountains or is it, let's drive to Greece. And then suddenly everyone's like, yeah, do it. This is how, you, this is how you do it. And, and I think that's one of the, I think that's one of the really cool things about the sort of community on there. And I also remember when Josh started it and I was like, like what's that? What's this? And then just watched it go. And then, and then realized it was, when I realised it was Josh, I was like, "Fair, fair play, mate." So, so yeah, yeah. It's I mean, for for anybody who um, obviously is thinking of starting off, once you once you get into one of these sort of community groups, it's a great place to be because immediately you're amongst family you're amongst people who are so passionate about the same things that you're wanting to do and everyone's willing to help you um you know if you've never done a season before it can be quite nerve-wracking so you know if you can be be in a place where you can ask people who've done it before and get advice it's a it's a, it's a great Actually, thing to, yeah. to, to be in i remember my first season and not knowing anyone who'd done a season before and not having any clue who to ask or what questions to even ask and it would have been amazing to have that community there just to to answer any and all questions mm. just what it's there yeah yeah so so so, so how so uh, how about you alex talk about how how you you've come on board with gsn so but, but like we've said me and josh me and josh are friends from a long from a long way back and yeah. i so i started in 2018 i started turtle straws and which is environmentally friendly drinking straws and we and i sold i basically had the was able to use my my skills of getting people interested and excited about things and so i went and sold two million two and a half million now i think drink by bi, like biodegradable effective drinking straws mm. and that was kind of and then i said to josh i was like mate we want to make, I want to help you make GSN like the place that people go to get jobs, to find accommodation, to do literally anything that is season or season related. I was like, I want to help you. I want to be a part of it. And I want to be the person that's able. Josh's background is, is technical and knowledge, like the knowledge of all the different jobs that are available for season airs, And mine's like, come on guys let's do this let's this is this is going to be the best thing ever and that's that's what i wanted to that's that's basically what i I actually came to you about this josh probably what the end of the end of last year yeah it was about a year ago we talked about it and then and then it wasn't the right time and then and then um yeah i I don't know i i guess you you, josh you're 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 more than welcome to talk about what tipped you over the edge to to bring me in but uh but yeah it's it was kind of that. I think. I guess that's what you, what yeah, you saw yeah. of, of bringing me on board. Definitely. Yeah, I had a lot going on. I've got a full time job anyway, as it is, and uh, trying to manage a job where well, I already sit in front of a computer every day. <laughs> to to running something else and trying to start something else where you also spend a lot of time staring at a computer and trying to balance work life with everything else. And it 
I just needed someone else to, to come up and sort of give me a fresh uh, look and a fresh insight into it. I was sort of, I've kind of run a little bit dry of ideas on how to market it and how to develop it a bit further. And Bruce is really good with all those sort of fresh ideas and keeping us both motivated to do new things. So, 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 so Josh, talk to me though a bit like behind the scenes because I looked on your website, right? And you've already got a couple of partners. So you, you, you work with one or two companies then in sort of helping uh, companies find workers as well. Is that right at the moment? So we've we've had a few different uh, business plans and business models that we've been trying to implement. And we, along with all of these things, we've used um, a few brands to help market us. So we've had people like After Jam um, and... Oh, no, my mind's gone completely blank. Um, Rubik's, Rub, Rubik's Kangaroo, Kangaroo yeah, Harmore, uh, Harmore, Harmore um, Bigger Creative as well. Yeah. Um, who have all um, generally quite small startup businesses who have given us prizes to run competitions. So we, last year we ran, or it was earlier this year, we ran a photo competition, so best seasonal photo. Um, and... Uh, best seasonal story as well. We've all got great stories from seasons. <laughs> I'm sure you guys have got just as many as me. Um, and this was a it was a great way to get some freebies out to the seasonaires and to get some marketing for these startup businesses. We've, as I say, we've got loads of members in our community, um, and to get those names out there was great for them. Mm. And what we've kind of settled with at the moment is um, something to try and help the employers for next summer we know that it's going to be uh, a big this winter no one really knows what's happening i'm sure we'll get onto that um shortly um, but next summer we've all got fingers crossed that something's going to happen and we know at that point uh, lots of these companies are going to need a lot of staff because all the staff that were working for them before including myself including bruce there have all kind of gone and got proper real jobs real uh, job. I hate that term. Uh, but it's it's one to describe it and it means that these companies are going to start having to look from from scratch for new staff mm. and so we're trying to put into place something to help them find staff as quickly as possible through yeah kind of with a with a, like a, if, if you post if you are a small company and you need to find someone very quickly post it like post it in the facebook group you will fill that position within mm within two days that's that's the way that that's the way that it works if you're if you're a larger like a mark warner or a, or a nielsen or something like that like a much bigger outfit then we we've got the reach and the and the ability to find you you say well, we need we need beach beach managers we need bike guides because they're notoriously difficult to get hold of and qualified nannies and we need a few people with um european passports to make our luck getting which is probably what we're going to get onto later on then we we can pick those people up and say here they are mm. and and we can and we can be like they've got this level of, exper of, ex of experience already and that's that's what we're sort of aiming to do for bit for bigger people or if they just like oh no we've lost we've lost and we've lost a nanny or we've lost a windsurf instructor we need to find someone really quickly then it's just mm. in send that into the group and uh, and you'll find and you'll find who you're looking for and it and it will be someone good as well because there's because because we've basically narrowed we've narrowed it so so much that we've just got the but with the with the group you're not posting onto indeed you're posting into a group that is specifically for seasonaires or people who want to want to get into seasonal work yeah i mean if you if you if you tried typing into in, indeed or one of these big sites for sort of you know seasonal type work you know you, you, you're not going to really find anything and this no. was this is something probably josh you can tell me on because of your tech experience i mean when you were going about setting this up you know looking out at the the recruiting side of things at the moment for these type of things what things didn't you like that you saw from other companies and what things did you like yeah so that was something that we thought about a lot when we were setting this up and our biggest thing at the moment or one of the biggest issues that we found was that there is there's actually a lot of job boards out there for seasonal work. You've got um, season workers, um, ski jobs, summer jobs, um, work work away. Uh, there's about 
I'd say there's about 10 or 15 different season air jobs boards and they all have very different things on there. Um, and a lot of the time they repeat themselves and it's just really hard to narrow all of that down into one place. And we'll see it's uh, you're never going to get everybody into one place, but we wanted to get as much as we possibly could into the same location to make it as easy as possible for people to find jobs and as easy as possible for people to find staff. Um, that was our main sort of aim was to just make it as easy as physically possible for everybody. And that's still our aim. We're not. Yeah. It's, it's pretty, it's pretty, it's pretty simple. What we're trying to do. We're just trying to make, we're trying to make everyone's, everyone's yeah. life. Right. As, rather as than have a personal job, yeah. So yeah. rather than have a personal job or look for a job, we're going to try and link people together with jobs um, and uh, link recruiters with staff without the need for all the fiddly bits in between, the posting a job for 20 quid and the waiting for people to apply for them and this, that and the other. We're kind of going to try and cut out that middle ground and just be able to link people directly and instantly with stuff and keep it fresh and like last year i noticed um i think i was trying to look for i was trying to look for something so that i could take me through last winter and i noticed one of the recruitment websites you applied and there the guy the guy behind the website didn't know whether the position had been had been fulfilled or not so you're like applying for all of these jobs and and it's like, well, uh, I don't actually know if that position has been filled or not, but we're, we're going to be the people. The idea is that we're going to be like, everything's going to be filled, gone, and then next next job, next job, so that people aren't applying for stuff that's so frustrating, applying for jobs that on that, websites that aren't, that aren't up to date. That's a really good point, and, and I, can, I can testify that firsthand. I'm sure like many people uh, in the last month or two, you know, October, November in particular, there's probably – there's probably been a bit more people than normal trying to find any sort of jobs and they've been going to all of these boards and they've been applying for all these jobs but they're not up to date and you find actually that the positions have been taken or sadly in a couple of cases the positions that are advertised on there are by companies that have gone out of business yeah, um, you're, on a job, yeah. you're on a job board and it's mary 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 ski head chef and you're like oh, but it doesn't actually say who it is and that's the other yeah. thing we'll just say that's the other that's the other part of it as well it's just going to be di and you'll see who, who it is and where it's going to be and how much mm. you get how much you're going to get paid because that's another thing that i know ticks josh and me off is when people are advertising jobs they don't have a wage attached to them mm. and it's and and I, and I and i just think it's i just think it's unfair that people are then going into interviews it's a difficult question to ask anyway yeah. just, put, just mm. put the number put the number there it's not if it, <laughs> it was a really large contentious issue at the start of last summer with recruitment um we had sort of around january time last year or sorry january time this year um lots of companies go in hard with recruitment for summer jobs and there was a huge consensus in the in the network and the community that companies should be posting their wages on jobs which i think is completely fair enough yep. and actually as a result of roughly uh, I think it was our largest commented post we've ever had on the Facebook group. It had about 150 comments on there, um, all with people asking for wages and um, almost demanding that wages be put on job posts. Hmm. And as a result of that, actually, Nielsen uh, were the first company to put all their wages across all of their jobs on their website. Um, and what we found as well is that over that period, we see there was a few other things contributing to it around eu laws and things but we did actually see a massive increase in in wages um for seasonal workers because a lot of it was that companies were putting these wages on their job on their job posts and kind of being a bit embarrassed about how low yeah. they were i don't i don't think that there's like we know that seasonaires don't get paid that much because you get give it because the package and what and what kind of comes with what kind of comes with it mm. but uh but I, and I but i just think that by i think by having that there it does kind of make make employers kind of stop and think and if it's like oh we're gonna pay a nanny 300 pounds a month i don't know if i want to put that on a on a on a on a 
group that's got 13,000 members on it. So it does mm. hopefully, hopefully kind of help, help that, that, that side of things a little bit. But I think everyone also needs to remember that, um, that we don't do this for the money. We do it for the, for the experience, for the mm. fact that you become, that being a, that being a season there and do it, makes you a fantastic communicator makes you able to you make you meet people that you would never would have met or been been friends with otherwise it makes you learn learn things i couldn't yeah i mean sure (laughs) i mean it's really interesting to hear to hear that because i mean it is widely accepted that probably seasonal workers don't get paid well um, the flip side of that is that, you know, depending on who it is you're working for and what line, you, you might get a subsidized uh, lift pass or, or even for free. Same thing when it comes to equipment hire or even accommodation. It, it varies company to company. But then at the end of the day, um, you're coming out, you're spending time away from home, from your family. Um, and sometimes you're working ridiculously long hours. So there's an element there where actually, you know, it's fine find to work less at the ability of to to for the experience of being out in the mountains or being on the beach but then it's also you know you don't want it to be the point where you're being exploited and there are various cases i think that that you know where people can maybe testify particularly in 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 the last maybe two decades ago that maybe that might be the case but it's interesting to hear that you said how some companies reacted to that josh so um Mm. I want to I want to delve in a little bit to the recruitment side of things, but we, we, let's try and inform a little bit of maybe some potential uh, new seasonal workers, people who may be thinking next year that they want to go work out on the beach or on the mountains. Um, one question I get asked a lot is, what personalities or skills do I have to have? What do recruiters tell you when they're looking for particular people? I mean, personally, um, when I've been looking for my own staff and when I've had recruiters asking for members of staff, the the biggest thing is communication. That is hands down what people are looking for. They want, at the end of the day, regardless of what job you're doing, unless maybe you're a KP or something like that, nearly all jobs in the season end, you're going to be talking to strangers on a daily basis, people you've never met, and you're going to be having to make small talk and... Um, chat with them, ask them how their day is, that sort of thing. So for me, it's a friendly face and just being able to communicate openly and comfortably with people. That's what I've always always found is the key skill. And then I, I would add that every single interview that I've ever sat down and done, I always get asked, tell me a time that you have gone above and beyond for a... Um, <laughs> For, for a guest or, or, or for how, tell, tell us about a time that you've gone above and beyond and I think that a lot of recruit a, a lot of companies are going to just be looking for people who are willing to give a little bit extra not just not it's not tools down at the, the second that you um that you finish if there's stuff that needs to be done and I think that's the thing to remember with doing these this kind of work there's no there's no such thing as tools down no, it's not like you clock off at five o'clock. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, because what Bruce said there, 100%, um, I've, I've been asked that in every single interview. Um, but people who've never done a season before need to remember that that doesn't necessarily have to apply to actual guests and actual customers that we have. It can apply to, to anything that sort of above and beyond goes to uh, people you helped out in the street or any of those sorts of things it's just a when you've gone that extra mile um, and like, like my, uh, my my example that i that i give is i talk about a time when i was in i was in uh lesbos in greece you might have come too josh um we were in a bar every like the whole the, like i guess 80 percent of the team were in a bar in lesbos and storm blew in and the uh, assistant beach manager turned around and said, guys, this wasn't forecast. So we all went to the beach, pulled the boats up an extra meter and then dropped the, uh, did something with the, I can't, I don't know, I was a nanny, so I don't know, I don't know what's going on, but um, <laughs> dropped, did something with the four stays on all the, on all the large double hander boats. Cause if not, there was a risk that these, these, these things were going to get damaged. So yeah, mm. that's, yeah. and I just think that people, if you, 
you just you just need to have that in your head if you're if you uh, are going into an interview. What 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 am I willing to to do to go above and beyond? And it was a fun experience doing going and running that everyone sprinting down there to go and fix the problem. And then we went back and had more beers. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I was there for that. And, uh, <laughs> Sozzled as well, probably. Nearly, uh, nearly all season air stories start with "I'm in a bar" or "I'm in a <laughs> yeah. bar." Without <laughs> to drop everything and go do something else. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah, no, hundred percent. It's that sort of thing. Is you're, I, I kind of hate it because sometimes it's, when you're on season, it does feel like a negative thing. But when you're on season, you are always at work, mm. whether you're jo- um, ju- at work during the day or whether you're asleep at night. Your uncle pretty much 24 seven. Josh, when did you go above and beyond? <laughs> oh, that's, uh, that's a mean <laughs> question to ask. Um, all right. So I was, um, it was back when I was a bike guide in Croatia and my bike shed where we had all the bikes, uh, was the walkway to the tennis courts. And I was still doing some maintenance on some bikes and this couple walked past they must i think they're in their 80s to go and play tennis and i always make a joke with these guys when they're walking past bikes to be like oh are you ready for your bike ride and most of them are like no no we're going to play tennis we don't ride bikes <laughs> <laughs> anyway and this woman walked past with her husband and um i made this joke and she was like i i can't ride a bike i've never ridden one um 80 years old and i told her when she's finished her tennis lesson to come back and um, I'll teach her to ride a bike. And we did about half an hour each day for their week holiday. Um, on their last day, they managed to go for a bike ride together into town and have coffee. First time she's ever been on a bike ride. So that was my above and beyond moment. Wow. And that that kind of story, you're just like, <laughs> you say that to a, um, and, and like, it's obviously epic that Josh, and, and Josh can also just tell, like, that's just a cool story to tell. Yeah. Uh, mm. And then you can sit down in an interview and say, I did this. And they'll just be like, let me get you a contract, mate. <laughs> yeah. I, I can sort of picture you there with a customer that you're trying to teach and you've sort of let them go off and they're sort of, the handlebars are wobbling and then essentially they get it and you're like, that's it, you're doing it. You're doing it. Yeah, 100%. That's it. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. it. It's such an yeah. exciting moment for you and, and for them. And yeah. that feeling of achievement. God, Matt, I've got to ask you yours if you. Yeah, yeah, yours. I was about to be like, on that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, I mean, there was one in my first season, um, and um, I mean, quite a few accidents in that first season. So, I was, in, I was working in Lehman Weir in the Three Valleys, um, just below Valterens. Um, there was um, one situation where a guy on Friday he had a really bad accident over in Meribel. Um, um, very typical. If you have a kind of like a bad accident, you either get helied off the mountain and get taken to a hospital down in the valley. Um, but what had happened was his skis got left up in one of the uh, gondola like places in Marybell, even though he was staying over in Lehman Weir. Um, so he's down there. The rest of his family, I think, left on the transfer day on the Saturday. He stayed a couple of days down. He called me up and explained, obviously, um, I was on rental skis. Um, what happened was actually I, I broke the skis. So um, I've got to I've got to pay the rental people back, but I'm obviously going to go through my insurance. Now, I broke one ski um, and the other one's fine. I need, can some, I need somebody to go and get them and take them back to the shop in Lehman Weir. Um, so after transfer day on Saturday, the next day, the first thing I did on my son, my Sunday, which for anyone who's worked a ski season, usually like your Sunday is kind of like your first major ski day. Uh, and you kind of want to go off and have a big day skiing and then obviously hit the hit, hit the pubs afterwards. But I skied uh, from Lehman where I went and got both the skis. I put them on my shoulder got back all on the lifts. I skied all the way back down into Lehman where handed them um, to the, to the guy at the shop. Um, the one ski, literally the entire base had ripped off the, the top of the ski. So it was like just flopping around. And he said, I, I, I don't need this. So I've actually got that ski left, but because of that, the guy was able to, to, it was able to keep that other ski, use it, 
and then the guy could claim back on his insurance. Yeah, nice. <laughs> nice. Nice. Yeah. Nice. yeah. So I, I think I got a good I think I got a good score on the feedback from that report, which yeah, uh, nice. yeah, which which led to a drinks token in which bar which bar was it? Um one that was doing free Josh shots, so I was happy with that. Josh shots, what's that? Yeah. Oh, have you never tried Josh shots? Okay, so uh, yeah, here we go. Here we right, okay. So um the thing is, I think actually in some countries they're banned. And I, I, for speaking of after jam, I get the feeling after jam are the only legal suppliers of Josh shots in the UK. So um, if anyone from after jam actually wants to sponsor this <laughs> channel with Josh shots, that might be a quite good thing. So Josh, it's like, um, <clears throat> it's like a powder sachet, like, like, oh, shirt. Oh, yeah. I've had it. I've had yeah. that. It's actually quite kind of nice, but it's also kind of disgusting. Yeah, like it's got like so like a sherbet dib dab type thing. So you put the, the put the powder in your mouth and it starts to to froth, and then you wash it down with a shot of vodka. Um, so if you're ever feeling flat and, and knackered on a night out, uh, one of them sorts you out. Two or three, and you're just um, yeah, you're on another level. Nice. Yeah. yeah. The first there was a guy. There's a guy called Chris Whiting. I'll uh, hopefully I'll watch this at some point he gave me one of those that i was i was already this was this this was this year actually i was already a mess i was absolutely like ruined big apre big apre session in the wrong point in mirabel um, oh, yeah. and then uh and then i think it i think it carried on and then someone in the middle of the night just goes here you go bruce and i'm like Normally, if someone's like, here you go in Maribel, you're like, oh, stand back. <laughs> but I had one, yeah, I had one of those and it was disgust, disgusting, I think. And then I had another one. I was like, okay, I could get, I could get behind this. Sim similar to like Craig David's or uh, Caliente's. That sort, of, well, that sort of vibe. So we're now talking about, obviously, experiences of season airs. Um, yeah. um, this is great because anyone who's, is wanting to be a seasoner. This is going to be highly beneficial for them. It may scare a few people off. It may spurn a few more people on. Anyone who's done seasons before is probably going to, you know, relate to a lot of what we're saying. Um, I want to, I want each of you guys to tell me a little bit about your first season and some of the things that happened there. <laughs> go on, Josh, uh, you go first. All right, so my first season uh, was, yeah, I so said 2012, summer season in Lesvos. Uh, I was working as a bike guide. Um, oh, no, I'm just trying to think what I can say and what I can't say. <laughs> um, no. Uh, so, oh, you bear with me. Um, Be bearing in mind you're repping the entire season air community with this. So, Yeah. <laughs> Um, Josh, Josh, you think about yours because I've got a story in my yeah, I've yeah, got a story in my yeah. head right right away. So yeah, two two thousand and ten. I worked for Sunset in Fanaki. Um in my first summer. I was eighteen. And I went out there very like really rugby rugby lad, like thinking I was really great. Didn't have a clue what was going on. And uh, I think some of the older boys just decided to decided to fuck with me a little bit. And I definitely deserved it. But then, so there was a chap called Scoop who's sort of in the sailing and winter. Not I don't know so much about in um, in winter, but like in the sailing, windsurfing, Nielsen, Sunsail kind of sphere. He's done. He's been around since like, for a long, long time. He's a very good sausage. But um, I, I think I potentially had tried to um, to uh, get with a young lady that he was interested in, and I was eighteen, and he was he's. I think six or seven years older than me, so I was I was like, oh, I'm really I'm really really sorry, mate. I'm really really sorry, and and he didn't care, but I didn't know, and I wanted this guy to like me. So he and we'd all been in our sort of spare time. We'd been watching Friends, and there's the episode where Joey gets with Chandler's a girl that Chandler's interested in. I think something like that. So they decided, they were like, Bruce, if you want to be back in the gang, then what you need to do is get in a box for three hours <laughs> and stay in it and be quiet. And then, and then you, can, and you can come and hang out with us again. 
18 year old British. I'm like, yeah, 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 that's fine, that's fine. So I went went up there at my allotted time period, 9 p.m. Bruce come up at 9 p.m. Get got in the box. There's pictures of this on Facebook somewhere. Got in the box. Everyone proceeded to have a party around me with all the drinks on the top of the box. I'm sitting there just in pitch black. My phone, which was only like it was like a Sam, like a real real old school piece of kit back then, ran out of battery within half an hour. So I'm just lying there like a rod in pitch black. Everyone had a really good, really good time around me. I got out sweaty as anything. We're in Greece in August, by the way, so it was it was gnarly hot it was horrible and then i got out at nine o'clock scoop gave me a hug said cheers guys everyone was absolutely shit-faced i was fine they all went to bed <laughs> but i got to be i got to be part of the cool gang again later and 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 scoop even told scoop was like i didn't think you were going to do that and you didn't have to and i was like yeah, no, but i had to do it to show that I that's uh, that, that that is commitment yeah uh, josh have you got yours mate yeah i mean i can't remember if this was i'm pretty sure it was my first season um it must have been towards the end of it because i'd already met these guests at the start of the year and they come back out um they were big into their cycling two couples um and me and the other bike guide I had taken them out pretty much every day on bike rides and it got to nearly the end of the week. They were, it was one of those birthdays, it was one of their 40th birthdays. I was 18 at the time and they were turning 40. Uh, so there was some live music on in the bar. So we just went down and said hello and we're like, I oh, will buy them a drink. It's their birthday. So I bought them, I think we bought them a Jaeger bomb and I don't think they'd ever had a Jaeger bomb before. Um, and so we were just sat there quietly chilling expecting not a lot to happen that evening and just have a nice quiet night and go back anyway next thing they come over and they bought us a pint each um only they'd put a jaeger bomb inside the pint so <laughs> down that um and then we're like well we've got to get them back because they've just done that to us so we then went to the bar and bought them um a round of hand grenades uh which Oh, God, I don't, I don't remember what's in a hand grenade now. I think I've had one of um, those before. I've bought you them before, Bruce, for your last yeah. day in Letters House. Yeah, that's it. Um, it's uh, two different shots. Um, you pull one, the other falls into a glass of beer, and then you do that. Um, it's pretty rough. And anyway, this turned into a whole escalation of them buying us drinks and we buying them drinks, and the drinks got gradually worse and worse and worse um, and stronger and stronger to the point where we could all barely stand. Um, at what point, um, me and the other bike guy decided it was a good idea to cycle home. Um, so as you can imagine, uh, some very intoxicated bike guides thinking that they're invincible, cycled back and um, made it home and that was the end of it. Until the morning that was, uh, when neither of us woke up for work and there was uh, a whole bunch of guests waiting to go on a bike ride. We got woken up by some other members of staff looking for us. Um, <laughs> gets worse. Where I, I uh, woke up, went into the bathroom to wash my face, and I walked past this puddle on the floor, and I was like, oh, no, I must have been sick in the night. So I just ignored it. I went to wash my face, brush my teeth, and get into work. And they then turned the light on, and they were like, "What, Josh, why is there a puddle of blood on the floor? Um, what? And in the night, somehow, on my either on the cycle home or once I got back, managed to um, hit my head on something and pass out on the floor. <laughs> um, Jesus, I didn't know this. Yeah, no, into a puddle of blood. So yeah, I woke up, found a puddle of blood, and they were like, "Josh, you got to go to hospital." Um, <laughs> I got taken to hospital. The other bike guy had to do the bike ride. Um, with a massive hangover i got a few stitches and um in my head still to this day no idea how i hit my head or what i what i hit it on um again thought that was the end of that went into the hotel later on that day to find the guests and make sure they were all right one of them the guy whose birthday it was hadn't emerged um he was still in bed and we later found out that he was a 
pretty much a recovered alcoholic. Um, I, I and knew that part. Had uh, just just about got himself to the point where he could have a glass of wine with dinner, um, and we had just completely ruined him. <laughs> Men so since a- he's absolutely fine. He's he's uh, still on the wagon. He's all good. But um, yeah, it was a pretty mental night. That okay. That's 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 a big big story. I think one of the the lessons here to point out for anyone who who's thinking about this is that. You go out and you have a good time, but you still have to show up to work the next day. That that's yeah, one of the 100%. things about seasonal workers is like you, you you find yourself becoming what I like to refer to as a high performing uh, alcoholic because you you do party quite a lot, but then you still have to show up for your you know your shift in the hotel or or your your mountain bike tour. With, with me in the first season, um, and this is kind of where like work and partying kind of like merged a bit. Um, and it was it was kind of cool. It was a cool story actually. So. Um, we had a, a set of customers who were um, arriving out the following week, um, and at that stage, um, you were able to find out on your website who your rep was kind of going to be for the next week. Um, and so, one of my fellow reps, who was based in in, in Val Terenz, um, gets a message through and says, um, "So next week, I'm going to propose to my girlfriend." Um, I'm going to propose to her in Valterrand, and I want to I want to do something really really special. Uh, I want to uh, you know I, I found this restaurant on the mountain. I want to book a table, take her out for a nice meal, everything like that. Um, can you can you guys go and and arrange this for me? And this was um, this was like the the, the Christmas week, week. It was um, she. I think she he wanted it to be on like Christmas Eve or Christmas Day. Uh, but what happened was my mate wasn't the best skier. He was high up. So I went to this restaurant. I went in. The best they had was like the 26th, 27th of December. Booked the table. What was going to happen was um, he was going to, with his girlfriend, they were going to, there was like this um, peace basher service where he was going to pick them up from their hotel, take them up to this um, this restaurant. Anyway, so the story goes that they go to the restaurant and um uh there's music they're having a meal it's quite busy there's music playing and uh, ed sheeran's thinking aloud out loud comes on the, the sort of the slow cheesy you know dancey one that he does and anyway he got down on one day and proposed to her um and she said yes so she said yes which which, which, which was great and um and anyway lo behold was it that night or the night after? I think it was the night after. They both came out on the on the pub crawl in in Val Terenz with us. So one of the positive things of going above and beyond in that situation was actually we got drinks pretty much bought for us um, while we were on while we were on the pub crawl. Um, anyway, nothing bad like else happened that was fine they came and they went off um but as i said i was based down in layman weir now for anyone who knows the three valleys there's a way that you can ski down from val to where val to rems to layman weir i um, mean it's like a a, a windy blue run go through the valley alongside the road but anyway um because i needed to be in my hotel the next morning and i was in val to rems and um, at about one or two o'clock in the morning i still had my skis in the resort with me um and it was a clear it was a clear night the moon was out and so i came up with the bright idea to ski down from val to Renz to lay Manuia that night <sighs> that's loose mate <laughs> yeah. yeah no yeah I, I made it i made it but i had a lot <laughs> yeah, of you are, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's very I mean, it's, good, it's a good story but yeah that's loose <laughs> Yeah. Um, right. Nice. So listen, we, uh, yeah, I mean, it's been great to share a couple of stories there. We've got to get on now to the one of the most, I think, perhaps actually the biggest challenge to the seasonal way of life, um, working overseas, doing the things that we all love to do. Um, and that is obviously in relation to to Brexit um, and what the future holds for this industry uh, post post your your uh, post January the first, um, I guess to start with this, 
what have been your concerns? What what have you guys been going through in regards to like motions and like for the last couple of months as we've got gone throughout this? Yeah, right. So I think the most difficult thing, and I found it with my other my other stuff as well that I do, is that actually no one knows what's going to happen, and there's there's supposedly people are trying to do a um, trying to cut a deal. Apparently Boris was up there today trying to do or something I don't like, but no one actually knows what's going to happen. So in my in my head. I've been like thinking, having sort of semi, but also being like, well, there's nothing I can really do, and there's nothing we can really do until we actually know what's going to happen. And then Josh said to me earlier, he was like, "We've all worked in Turkey," and and then Josh, if you just go on and say, say, yeah, say, I mean. Yeah. I used to work in Turkey um, as a bike guide, and it, it's it wasn't hard. We just had to get visas. It was simple as that. Yeah. Um, I think yeah, like Bruce said, the hardest thing is the not knowing, it, and it's the the constant indecision and the constant change of plans. Um, we changed uh, the GSN sort of business model about three times. Uh, it's partly to do with COVID, partly to do with Brexit, and we just don't know, really know what's going on, and that. I think is the hardest part for us and i think i've been going over it there will always be a need for, for seasonal workers that's inevitable there'll always be a demand i think it's just waiting it's and it's the waiting to find out exactly what's going to happen and how we're going to deal with it how it's gonna how it's gonna unfold the thing is you think about in in the uk there are jobs that you've like you've got Sheila, who in who voted for voted out, who was cross that Polish people work in England, and 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 that's a sh and it's it's a massive shame that that we voted out. But we can't do anything about it now, so we just have to react. But unfortunately, at the moment, we've got nothing to react to. People freaking out that Mer like for instance, Meribel, where I spend where I spend half half of my year each year, apart from at the moment, apart from this. <laughs> this year um is so english and there's so many english businesses out there and there's so many english people mm -hmm. living out there if you pull the plug out if you pull the plug out of the bath the bath has got to empty and then you've got to refill it again and mm. and, and, and i guess and and there's and there's only so much even if you re even if you have the people in france to refill those positions but there's it's the again it's the jobs these are jobs that english people want to do in the same way that in 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 the UK we have jobs that that people from the, the English people don't want to do, but other 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 nationalities are very very happy. To... That's that's just kind of my my take on it. I think potentially this year, I think definitely this year, if you want to do a winter, if um, it's going to be it's going to be much harder. Um, but I think in the future doing doing a winter it might i don't need, i don't think that the sort of standard pack go out and you get a you get a lift pass and you get accommodation and you get a job i don't think that's going to die mm. um that's this is now i'm i'm now speculating this is my this is my opinion and i think it's and i think josh shares that opinion i think if it's if it's going it, to, it might get a little bit harder, but then that's going to be better for people who, that's going to be better because people who really want to do seasons are going to be out there doing seasons and employers who really want, who really want English people out working for them are going to have people who really want to be out there who are willing to do, go, go the extra mile as we've spoken about. Uh, yeah. They're going to be able to find those people who are willing to do that. But yeah. Yeah, I think when you, if you look at it from a perspective of 15, 20 years ago, or even eight years ago, when I was looking through my first season, uh, it was it was quite challenging to get your, your first job. And the level they were expecting was very high. And um, as the industry's grown, it's so much bigger than it was a few years ago. 
um, summer seasons and ski seasons, um, and the holiday industry has just boomed through the roof over the last sort of ten years. And what it's resulted in, um, and I'm not taking anything away from anybody here, but it is a li- it is easier to find a job, um, and there's more jobs available. And I think what we'll find with Brexit is that there is going to be there's straight up there's going to be less jobs. We've already seen a lot of um, operators and small businesses close. So straight away, we're going to find that there's less people, there's less jobs going. And what we're probably also going to find, depending on what happens, is that a lot of those positions might be filled by locals. But it, it and it's going to set us back down to, to a, a lower level of jobs available. But that industry will always grow again. It will always. And the, the beauty of um, sort of the positive side of places closing is that it opens the door for new businesses, um, whether that be new tour operators on a big scale or whether it be small businesses and people looking to set up their own thing. People yeah. have maybe done seasons for the last 10 years and fancy setting up their own chalet. It opens people that swap, door yeah. up massively. I think, I think it's going to be for, epic for the for the for the sort of yeah. lifetime for the lifetime um mountain mountain dweller rather than season yeah. there it's going to be epic for those for anyone who wants to who's built relationships with with um with chalet owners or people in people in resort to mm. s- swallow up these these chalets that have been um that are being left vacant by the likes of mary ski and it's almost and, like um, it's, you know, a reset button and it's yeah. just going to open I mean, the door think... for a whole new sort of yeah i mean this, a, a I think, whole new I think yeah, I mean, what people need to realise, I mean, if if they're thinking about doing it, is that you've got the situation with Brexit. Added to that, sadly, the coronavirus has in fact taken a big hit um, on on particularly the tourism industry. Um, it's been massively hit. I mean, you you mentioned Maribel as being one place where you know the Brit- there's a huge British community of businesses and, and workers. It's the same with Morzine in another part. I'm, I'm hearing all kinds of um, uh, horrible stories there of businesses going out and 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 all sorts. And and sadly, we're, we're in that time now. We're losing jobs because of COVID. Um, as Brexit evolves, I think. What what you'll find is that, and this was something which was we mentioned in my discussion with um, uh, 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 Diane speaking from SBIT is that actually the in, the industry as a whole is actually it, it's squeezing a bit at the moment. It's it's contracting, so it, it's it's been expanding for a number of years. It's been going through a bit of a transition in the last couple of years because of growing trends, um, and that have now been kind of accelerated by COVID and also because of Brexit. So. It's going to recover, but it's going to take a couple of years. But you know, if you're if you're a, someone who, who's very passionate about going out there and doing this stuff, you know, you'll eventually find a way. And um, yeah, 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 hundred percent. It, it will always recover, hundred. And there'll always be the need for the holidays. There'll always be the need for the staff. It's as simple as that. And, the, and the, I think that you've got to look at where where people where people spend their money. A lot of people who, a lot of so punters, spend their money on going on holiday and drinking and drinking in bar, pubs and bars. So there is there is gonna there is gonna at some point have to be a resurgence because people haven't had an opportunity to spend their money on on these things because of these are the industries that have been uh, that have been been affected. So so yeah, I think yeah. I don't know, and I, and I think um, you also, I think that you'd you'd find like there's a lot of people that would be able to find a way of it. Yeah. I mean, one of the, one of the things you, you, you just touched on it there, obviously like um, th- there are these hotspot destinations and especially be- it's already been shown that there is a pent up demand now. Like there are so many people actually whilst it, it's, it, there's a lot of people who have lost jobs, um, you know, season airs have been, tr- I've had to probably pick up other jobs, you know, maybe proper jobs but to, to get by at home. But actually there's people who normally throughout the summer or by now would have booked 
to go on their holidays instead they can't but they they can't go and spend that money on a pub they can't go and yeah. spend it, you know having a weekend away somewhere on the coast so actually a lot of people do have money saved up and when it is eventually allowed and it will be allowed post brexit it, it might be that travelers also have to get a, a visa but then you know that was the case before the european union you know came in my dad tells me you know they used to have to travel and get visas all over the place you do it if you have to go to the u.s you do, if you, it's not you do if you go to the u.s yeah and you do it yeah. if you go to australia or, or any of the yeah anywhere it's, right it's just uh... exactly and when this all comes down is that you know the brits they're still going to go to ibiza and magaluf they're still going to go to morzine and marybell they're still going to go to the places in greece in turkey um so there is going to be that need for staff you're right that the the makeup of that staff might be a little bit different but um one thing that i raised with diane in the interview a couple of weeks ago was that i said well in the case of france if there's all this belief that actually some of the jobs that are there are going to be taken up by locals i said to them where have the locals been, you know, all the years that these jobs have been available? You know, why weren't they, you know, lining up for jobs with Nielsen, Tui, um, bars that were actually in the resorts? Um, and, and one of the things that was pointed out, actually, specifically with tour operators, is that like that those chalet roles or those holiday rip roles don't exist in that country. So for the locals, they don't know what that job is. They don't understand it and they don't want to do it. So... Yeah. yeah, and there's something else that um, I think will arise out of this, and it's already started happening. Obviously, COVID's put a bit of a hold on it, but we saw it hugely over the summer. Is that the UK holiday industry is booming, um, or was booming, and staycations have become a massive thing, um, and so many more people are deciding to holiday in the UK. So, what it's going to do? It's going to open up a huge opportunity for people who might normally want to go and work away um, abroad and do seasonal work. They can do that kind of seasonal work in the UK. They might not get the weather that <laughs> you want when you go to Greece or to Spain or wherever, and you might not get the snow that you get in the Alps. But the same kind of jobs are available. And even if it's not a long-term thing, it's a great way for staff um, or people who are looking to do their first season in a year or two to go and work in those places, like places like PGL, as soon as this um, COVID stuff is is done with COVID, uh, PGL for, as a prime example is going to go through the roof. Um, they're going to have so many clients wanting to do um, do their holidays in the UK rather than go abroad, just partly because it's cheaper, partly because of Brexit, um, and those jobs. Once people have found done a job, done a season or two working with in the UK. It's much easier to find a job working in France or Greece or abroad. Um, you've got those skills that are transferable automatically and you'll be able to find a seasonal job really quickly. Um, and then, yeah, oh, I was going to say, and then on top of that, I think that posit looking positively into the future, um, I, I think that you're going to see people see people going and seeking seeking stuff further i think did you say that you've worked in japan before yeah yeah so you've worked in japan and i think we're going to see more of that people going and seeking work outside of your typical greece greece and france for, for mm -hmm. instance i think you're going to see people we've got clients in in the u.s uh, got some some guys called campwick are just looking for people to coach wakeboarding and like, i mean we're not i'm not talking about winter stuff here but looking for guys to look after each and i think that potentially you'll see more stuff like that with people going and doing um winter winters in the summer in in, in australia and, and in new zealand because i think those relationships are gonna get are gonna get kind of built built on and people are gonna if people don't have the option or or the option of going to france is just as difficult to go into australia new zealand or, or america these are all places where they speak they, they speak English and a good insurance package and and you mm -hmm. and you're bloody good to go and, and and so I think I think that's it's something that when I was doing that when I was in Nipper doing seasons just wasn't even on on the table and I and I think that's I think that's something that we'll see more of. Yeah, I mean with, with, with the Japan situation, I, I, 
I'll have to do my re research into it, but I get the feeling we've already agreed a trade deal with Japan. So, you know, and and the the Finnair run um, direct flights sometimes um, in the winter from the U. They did run direct flights from London to Sapporo on the North Island of Hokkaido next to next to Niseko. So, um, they they are able to go out there and and and, and get easy access. To to there although i mean i know there was a lot of there would be two seconds i'll be back in a moment <laughs> sorry yeah no that's, that's right. fine mate All right. um one one thing that i would love to see in negotiations with america is the ability for people to go and work seasons summer or winter in the u.s because it is quite hard you know, to go out there and, and America has a, you know, you know, my background is obviously primarily skiing and America has a massive extensive, extensive um, ski, ski area there. But a lot of their workers are all, are all just local, which is not a bad yeah. thing, but, but uh, you know, you can, it, it, the English can get to Canada, they can get to Japan, they can get to Europe, but um, America has always been quite hard. Yeah. And I, and I just, I just wonder if, I wonder if we get, if we get squeezed, on the european side of things mm. whether whether but and, and there is i don't and, and there's i don't know like i'm not a politician i don't know that much, like that much but i do i i think that potentially i mean lot i know people who've gone and done camp like camp america and and there and i and i just think that it's i think that it's something that i'll definitely be putting more and more like we've got there's the guy there's there's this, these guys that i that i mentioned earlier who are super excited to be working with us camp camp winner do and if we can get more and more more and more people like um like that and if we can get some sort of some bars or or something in north star or keystone or Bre breckenridge and we can mm. start placing placing people then that's going to be that's going to be epic and that's going to that's going to take a lot of the jitters and butterflies and worries that people are that people will feel like that long time long term seasoners have been feeling. It's going to t it's going to take that take that away. And I don't I don't know, but I think it's definitely where in in it, my area of the, of this, it's what I'm going to be aiming to to do. To but do more it, of. I mean, a lot of people find the uncertainty post Brexit is obviously worrying, and that you know well, you've seen a number of headlines of things that are going to get taken away from his jobs and everything. But but you're right, you know, a lot you can look at it positively and well. Okay, well actually, there's new opportunities. We might be able to go over now and start working in the states, and like you yeah. just said, create a brand new side to the the community that hasn't been touched on yet. Um, yeah. Listen, guys. Go on. No, no, I didn't have it. No, I was just, I was just drinking a beer and bit again, <laughs> just, bit, just agreeing with you. No, no, I think it's, I think, yeah, you've hit that. It just, and I think that's another thing that people need to remember to do. If you can flip something on its head, then, 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 do, then just do that. People yeah. will, yeah. The ski industry will recover because it's what people spend the money on. We might get a chance to go to America and work out, work out there. Yeah. Um, listen, guys, we've almost got to wrap it up. So just one last thing for, from each of you on this. I mean, it's my personal belief. January, we're probably all going to be still sat here within the UK, but it is going to be probably where we start gaining more clarity on what things are going to be like. What do you think we're going to see in relation to seasonal work um, from the deal or no deal? Um, I, yeah, I mean, I think it's going to be, uh, I think that the instant is going to be for companies to shrink slightly, maybe have a few less employees, but still operate almost to the capacity that they were previously. And they're going to go instantly into trying to source visas and things like that. I think is going to be the, what the, what's going to happen instantly. People are going to start looking into next summer straight away as soon as they can as soon as they know what's going to happen and then from there i think further into that people companies will start looking like bruce said to go further afield and to try new things and different things but i think the instant reaction is going to be to try and operate as normal as possible under the circumstances that they've got personally is that is why yeah yeah and that's i i'm just completely behind josh on that to be honest that's 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 He's, he's summed up, but this is our 
this is what this is what we both think is going to happen. So yeah, I, I don't really have anything to add on on that side mm. of it. Awesome. Listen, guys, I really appreciate you both coming on and, and taking the time um, this evening just before Christmas. Um, it's been great to learn about yourselves, uh, to learn about Global Season Air Network, obviously to recant a couple of um, Season Air stories, ones that we can tell on, on Yeah, ones that we can tell on, on, on camera um, and obviously talk about <laughs> The situations that we're um, that we're facing, uh, uh, you know, in the in the short in the short term and also long term, it'd be cool to check back with you guys actually in the new year. Um, if you guys are happy to come back on and we can sort of touch base with how things have progressed, um, to leave us with guys, just how tell me how can people find Global Season Air Network? Go on, Bruce. Josh. <laughs> oh, uh, uh, just. <laughs> Global Season Air Network group, get 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 in the group. If you want to follow us on Instagram and on, and, and on Facebook, then do that. But if you, uh, to be honest, I think both of us will agree that be in the group, and that's where you, that's where you're going to see the real benefit of being in, of, of of the community and being involved with with yeah. that jobs information, people to connect with, and jump on the website. The um, questionnaire is on there. There. We will have newsletters going out with loads of jobs on there. Um, so, yeah, just fill in that little questionnaire. It gives us a load of data that we sort of work on and um, figure out exactly what's going on in the industry um, and who's around. Um, but, yeah, so it's globalseasonnetwork.com um, and the Facebook page. But, yeah, Just fill that, fill, that, fill that questionnaire out and then we will be able to – you're just putting yourself in the best position to get – placed in a good in a good location with a good with good people down the line brilliant well listen guys thanks very much for joining i'm just going to take you out of the studio for a minute and i'll come back to you in a second uh but thank you very much everyone for watching today's video i hope you've enjoyed it just before christmas a bit of light-hearted stuff but also talking about a couple of serious issues that are facing us uh obviously post brexit um if you do have any questions feel free to put them in the description below. If you enjoyed this video, smash the like button and also subscribe to the channel. Uh, but that's it from me, guys, for a couple of days now. I'm going to get off and party with the family, um, obviously following the restrictions. But uh, I hope you all have a very Merry Christmas and I will see you next time.